Today we're going to talk about CTOs or chronic total occlusions. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dr. Tamala's Vascular Channel, and follow me on Twitter at Srini Tamala so that I can bring you new videos on a weekly basis. So without further ado, let's get started. We all know that when we're dealing with CLI patients, we're going to be dealing with CTOs, and if we want to achieve results like this in, order, in terms of revascularization and crossing CTOs, we have to understand some basics. Obviously, CTOs are arterial occlusions lasting more than 30 days. They're composed of smooth muscle cells, connective tissue, calcium, thrombus, lipids, inflammatory cells. And when you're dealing with tibial CTOs, there's even cells of cartilage and bone, which can make crossing them very challenging. 40% of patients with symptomatic P PAD typically have CTOs, and obviously there's a high percentage uh, above and below the knee. What are the challenges with CTOs? Obviously, when you're dealing with CTOs and trying to cross them, it, can result in prolonged procedure time, increased radiation exposure, higher contrast volume because you may need to do more angiographic runs to try to visualize the CTO and cross it, higher likelihood for dissection, AV fistula formation, and perforation, which can really result in a more uh, or higher likelihood of stent placement. CTO crossing failure rate is typically 20% or more when uh, physicians are getting started, and obviously as you become more experienced, you want this to be less and less. And if you've never seen a CTO under a microscope or in cross-section, this is really what it looks like. You can see the black arrows are really showing you all the tiny micro-channels of varying sizes. And this really shows you why some physicians make a big point of guide wire escalation, starting with 014, then 018, then 035. Basically, they're trying to get into these micro-channels in order to successfully cross the CTO. When you're looking at CTOs, you also have to understand the concept of the hibernating and the non-hibernating lumen. A hibernating lumen just means that you have a proximal and distal cap in a CTO, but in between those caps, the channel is open. It may be filled with debris and fibrotic tissue and so forth, or even thrombus, but it's not occluded all the way through. And these are not, uh, this part of the CTO is typically not seen angiographically and therefore is angiographically occult. When you're dealing with no hibernating lumen, you basically have a chronically occluded tube from proximal to distal cap, and crossing it can be very difficult at times. And to really show you a couple of examples of hibernating vessels, this is what they look like. Here's a CLI patient's got a stump of a dorsalis pedis artery on the left, and we're not sure whether the vessels in the foot are completely occluded with no hibernating lumen, or we have hibernating vessels. And you can see once I crossed the CTO, you can see that there's robust filling of numerous vessels in the foot, which showed you that there were a lot more hibernating vessels here than we thought. Another example is this right here. You can see it's another CLI patient with a wound on the bottom of his foot. He's got an occluded distal posterior tibial artery. After that, it's tough to tell whether we're dealing with hibernating or non-hibernating vessels. Once I cross the posterior tibial artery occlusion, you can see there's robust filling of vessels in the foot, including an angiographic wound blush. And so this is another example of hibernating vessels. C-top classification is something you should really be familiar with if you're dealing with CTOs because this gives you an idea of the different CTO types that you will deal with and whether you should approach them anagrade, retrograde, or may need dual access. Obviously, it's not perfect, but at least it gives you a guide of how to approach CTOs when you're dealing with your CLI patients. The interesting thing is that here's an article that really talked about why certain caps look a certain way. If you look at the distal cap in this example here, you can see that there's, there are large uh, collaterals, there's numerous collaterals, they're transporting a large volume of blood, and as a result, the distal cap was eroded by the pressure of this flow from these collaterals, and as a result, has a concave shape. On the other hand, when you have smaller collaterals or re less robust collaterals, there's less pressure head hitting that distal cap, and as a result, that cap may be flat or even convex. Today, the good thing is that you know there are various articles and tables and uh, flow charts that really give you an idea of where to start with CTOs so that you can have some level of an algorithmic or logical approach when you're doing this. And you know, initially, this all started in the coronary literature, and it was kind of uh, used to come up with peripheral guidelines. And now we even have a peripheral or lower extremity CTO uh, algorithm that was developed by the PCTO working group and was presented at TCT in 2018. If you've never seen CTOs, this is what they look like. 
iliac CTO, we've got the next image, the SFA, then a popliteal, and then a tibial. So obviously you're going to see CTOs on a daily basis when you're dealing with patients with critical limb ischemia. A couple of basics. Obviously, there are various catheters that are specifically labeled as CTO catheters. Each company makes them. They're different sizes. You don't have to know all of them. Learn one or two or three, become an expert at it, and use that as your go-to CTO catheters when you're dealing with uh, your CLI patients. And the same really goes for CTO guide wires. These guide wires are made by all the different companies that are in this space. They all have various names and various uh, tip loads. And so again, you don't have to know all of them, just become an expert at a few of them or several of them and really understand their characteristics so that you'll be successful when trying to deal with CTOs in the peripheral space. One concept that many people are not as familiar with as, as, as they think is guide wire tip load. Guide wire tip load really means the minimum grams of pressure needed to deflect or buckle the distal one centimeter of a guide wire two millimeters. And this is really known as guide wire tip load. And guide wires are really made with low tip loads ranging in the four gram and all the way up to 25 or 30 grams. And so you really want to understand the concept of guide wire tip load as the higher the guide wire tip load, the more penetrating, the sharper it is, and the more likely it can dissect or even perforate. And so you have to be very careful when using these guide wires. Here's an example of three different CTO guide wires. Uh, and when you look at these videos from left to right, you're gonna see low, then medium, and then high tip load guide wire. And you can see really that the higher the tip load of the guide wire, the less prolapse you get the distal one centimeter. If you look at the far left, you get a lot of prolapse, then less in the middle, and then almost none when you go to the higher gram uh, tip load guide wire uh, on the far right. Obviously, there are numerous recanalization techniques when you're dealing with CTOs. I'm going to show you a few basics in this case. Here's an example of an SFA uh, CTO that I needed to cross. And I'm using three different techniques to cross the CTO. As you can see on the far left, I'm using a four French Navy cross uh, catheter by Terumo in this case. And you can see that I'm basically rotating and advancing the catheter and using tactile sense to get a feel for am I still within the CTO and have not perforated out of the artery. So that's called Navi bossing and that's one technique. If you look at the middle video, you can see I'm using a CTO catheter and a low tip load guide wire. It may be hydrophilic in this case. And basically I'm allowing the wire to prolapse and then using that loop to basically dissect through the CTO. On the far right, you can see it's another technique. It's a technique where I have a CTO catheter. I've created a small loop with the uh, CTO wire, which is typically, in this case, again, low gram tip load guide wire. And I've created this loop, and then I push the entire system together to recanalize the CTO. So three separate techniques of uh, crossing an SFA in this case. And then here's the final result, which achieved really an excellent angiographic result. Here I'm going to show you uh, a way that I dealt with a tibial CTO and a few basic concepts on CTO recanalization techniques. As you can see here, I've got a CLI patient with really severe occlusive disease below the knee and, and, and most likely even below the ankle. And my thought here was that let's recanalize the anterior tibial artery, the pedal loop if needed, and then the TP artery trunk, and then see what kind of healing we get based on a successful revascularization. And so you can see here, I basically have access from above and below. My catheter and guide wire systems are in two different subintimal planes, and they're not communicating. And I need to do something to get these two channels to communicate to achieve through and through access. So technique one, uh, in this case, you can do what's called cart and reverse cart. And what this means is that you're basically putting a balloon either from below in cart or above in reverse cart. And you're basically doing an angioplasty to disrupt the tissue between these two systems and then allow through and through access uh, with a guide wire either from below or above, depending on which uh, way you've uh, advanced the balloon. And you can see here, here's an example of that. This is a case where I couldn't get through. I put a balloon from above, so this is called reverse cart. I did a 2.5 to 3 millimeter angioplasty, and once that was done, then I was basically able to recanalize via a CTO, using a CTO guide wire from below, achieve through and through access, and then ultimately advance the guide wire through the catheter and sheath at the groin. 
and then I had through and through access uh, in order to then proceed uh, further with uh, delivering therapy. Another technique you can use is basically called navi bossing, which I showed you already. It's basically using a four French navi cross catheter from Terumo, and you can see here I'm basically on the far left in two different subintimal planes with the catheter and guide wire system from above and below. I use the uh, four French Terumo navi cross catheter to do a navi bossing technique and disrupt the tissue between the, uh, the two subintimal planes, which then allows me to get through and through access and ultimately advance my catheter and guide wire from below into the system from above and achieve through and through access. And once that's done, you can basically reverse your access, meaning that once the guide wire is pulled through the sheath at the groin, I can advance a catheter over it and advance it down as distal as possible. And you can see here I did an angiogram. I have extravasation at the pedal access site, which is okay because we will be doing angioplasty to seal that at the end of the case. And in the image on the right, or the video on the right, you can see I was able to basically recanalize through that occluded dorsalis pedis artery and eventually get into the pedal loop. I did uh, good vessel prep. In this case, I did orbital atherectomy, angioplasty, treated all the vessels, and ultimately was able to get a two-vessel runoff with a good angiographic wound blush uh, involving this large, large non-healing wound that was involving his, uh, uh, the lateral aspect of his foot. And here's that angiographic wound blush, which is a good CLI angiographic endpoint. And at eight months, we were able to really achieve very significant healing uh, in conjunction with our uh, excellent podiatry uh, team and, and their wound care. So I want to thank you for watching, and please subscribe to my channel, Dr. Tamala's Vascular Channel, and follow me on Twitter at Srini Tamala. Thank you.